All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another ACE session. Uh, today, we are here together with Professor Oliver Schulte. Uh, Oliver is a professor at the School of Computing Science at Simon Fraser University, uh, which is located in Vancouver in Canada. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. He's published papers in leading AI and machine learning venues on a variety of topics, including machine learning, sports analytics, causal graphs, and game theory. Growing up as a soccer fan and competitive chess player, he's been intrigued by strategy and tactics in game. And uh, just before this, real quickly, I'll introduce what ACE is in case it's your first time joining us. So Aggregate Intellect is an online machine learning platform. We host uh, talks like this, which are available to watch on YouTube for free. Uh, we also have a lot of content on our site, uh, AI.Science. So feel free to check out the archives of all past talks. Uh, as well as a lot of our other curated uh, content, which helps people understand machine learning research uh, in terms of uh, like some prerequisite knowledge that we have. Uh, so definitely check out our site, uh, AI.Science, or subscribe to our YouTube channel for uh, lots of talks in different areas, such as this reinforcement learning stream and mm -hmm. other topics in machine learning as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to uh, Professor Oliver Schulte. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to uh, this event. Um, and also my thanks to Susan and AISC for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you about some of my work. Uh, I'll be discussing applications of reinforcement learning and sports analytics. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm uh, at the School of Computing Science at uh, SFU. And this term, I'm also working half time at Sport Logique which is a uh, Canadian uh, sports data analytics provider and company based in Montreal. Um, so I wanted to start with just a high level overview of sports analytics um, and what's going on there. Uh, it's been a lot of growth in the industry. I gave, got a little chart from uh, a consulting company. Um, and uh, with a growing interest in sports, sports analytics, uh, there have been a number of um, commercial data providers. Uh, in addition to Sport Logique, big names are Stats Perform, Sports Radar, and sports analytics is a great area for machine learning because we have uh, many data already and they keep growing. So like every game night generates a couple of thousands of uh, event data points. Uh, a lot of growth in academia, too. Um, probably the most visible conference is the MIT Sloan Conference, organized by MIT's business school. Um, sells out quite regularly. Uh, there have been a growing number of um, sports analytics papers and AI-related conferences. Um, actually, KDD, two years ago, the best paper award in the industrial track went to a sports uh, soccer analytics paper. Uh, if you're more oriented towards journals, uh, I put a couple of references here uh, to uh, kind of statistics-based journals. Um, I can make a brief plug for our own group uh, at SFU. We have a sports analytics group. Um, we have Peter Chow White, who's in communications, Tim Schwartz in stats. And he actually won a lifetime award for um, from the American Statistical Association for his contributions to sports analytics. Uh, myself, Peter Tingling is in the business school, look born in stats, Dave Clark in kinesiology, and John Stocky in math. So one of the things that I find uh, exciting about sports analytics is that it's a really interdisciplinary uh, endeavor, and many people from different disciplines are interested in sports data and finding patterns and insights. Uh, not just computer science or and not even just statistics. Uh, from a statistical point of view, there are a number of uh, really interesting and novel challenges. If you're used to more traditional um, classification regression uh, type of framework, um, so modeling and learning game strategies, um, multi-agent systems, right? We have lots of different agents interacting with each other. Uh, highly structured data, so everything is happening in time and space. Um, so if you work on stochastic processes, then this is actually a, a dream application area. 
and uh, lots of decision-making problems uh, for all the stakeholders. Um, just to mention a few identifying strengths and weaknesses, uh, sports analytics, they often call this the gap analysis. Uh, so what is it that we need to do uh, to get to the top? Uh, recommending tactics like, oh, you should play down the right side of the field, that's where the opponent is weak, and opponent modeling to find these kind of patterns. Um, okay, um, so my own view is that uh, Sports analytics should be thought of as part of reinforcement learning, or more precisely, one of the major application areas of reinforcement learning. So I think that reinforcement learning has uh, the resources to answer many, maybe all, questions in sports analytics. Uh, so if there's one picture I'd like you to take away from this talk, it's this Venn diagram, right, where you see sports analytics as part of RL. Uh, Hey, I wanted to do uh, just very brief discussion of the main problems in sports analytics uh, before getting more specific. Uh, there's a nice book I can recommend, Sports Data Mining. Uh, very easy to read, and uh, you can get it online for free by Schumacher et al. And they distinguish three major types of problems. Uh, so one is gathering the data, which is often known as tracking in uh, sports analytics. Um, and that tends to involve, at least these days, it involves a lot of computer vision. So you can see bounding boxes, uh, identifying players, and finding their locations. Um, so this is really kind of the core of the business of Sport Logique, the company I'm working for this term. Uh, they do a lot of computer vision. Uh, then there's player evaluation, uh, right? how good are the players and what are the strengths and weaknesses. So that is uh, where most of my research has been focused and what I'll be uh, going into today. And then the uh, last major type of problem is prediction, in particular match outcome predictions. So like who's going to win, who's going to get the next corner. Um, okay, and then with each of these categories has been a lot of work. Um, uh, so our own approach has been to use reinforcement learning, as I mentioned, and reinforcement learning is based on Markov models. So we've developed uh, actually several Markov game models for the NHL, but I'll just uh, um, present one today. Uh, NHL stands for National Hockey League. Uh, and this is the RL stream. So I'm going to assume that most people have background in Markov decision processes, uh, but I'll just do a one slide uh, kind of review. Um, so the most basic uh, Markov model is a mark known as a Markov process or Markov chain. So you have a set of states, and then um, the process moves from one state to the other uh, according to a transition probability. And so I have a demo of that to make this visual. So you can visualize this, uh, the state space as a set of nodes uh, connected by uh, links according to whether the transition is possible or not. And then there's a transition matrix which specifies the probability of traveling along any particular link. And then uh, if you run the process, uh, then you can see uh, the process moving from node to node according to the transition probabilities. Uh, and it just uh, goes on forever. Okay. And uh, go back to my slides. Okay, so from this basic model, if you add more and more components, you eventually get to a mark of game. So the first component is a reward, which measure, measures how desirable a state is for an agent. Okay? So that's, that will give you what's called a Markov reward process. So in sports, a reward would be something like winning the game, scoring a goal, scoring a certain number of points. Okay? So that depends on the application. Then you can add actions, uh, and you get what's called a Markov decision process. Um, so in hockey, uh, actions of interest would be things like a shot, a pass, a hit, a face-off. And then uh, finally, uh, if you have not uh, just one agent, but multiple agents, uh, all of whom are taking actions, then you get a mark of game. Um, and in a mark of game, you can think of transitions depending not just on the current state, uh, but also on the actions taken by the agents.
So I'll just let you look at that. Uh, at that. So that's the key uh, definition here. Uh, let me visualize this a bit on a hockey rink. Uh, I don't think I can make this much bigger. But here, I'll run this and then comment and then run it again. So what we want to do here is we you take the location of the puck, which you see changing. Uh, and so the puck is acting much like a Markov process. And then you see the actions. There was a reception. There was a carry here. And then when uh, the player performs the action of carrying, um, then uh, that can be modeled as changing the transition probability because the, the probabilities depend not only on the state, but also on the actions. So let me run that one more time because that was a bit uh, quick. OK, so we start. The first reaction uh, event is, uh, well, here we have a block. And there's a check, which sends the puck back. Pass sends it up. Reception moves the pack over to the puck over to the other side. And then finally, we have a carry. Okay. And uh, carrying the puck made it more likely that it ended up in the other opponent's uh, team. So uh, what I'm hoping to illustrate is that it's actually very natural to think of the dynamics of sport in terms of a Markov process, right, where the, the match is moving from one state to the other, um, and the dynamics is uh, changed through actions by players. Okay, so uh, for our specific NHL model uh, that I will discuss tonight, I'm going to uh, our state space um, is uh, built as follows. Uh, here we basically use the sport logic data, so we know at any given time what the location of the puck is, the velocity of the puck. We know how much time is remaining in the game, other things like the manpower. Um, and so this gives us a number of variables. And then uh, an assignment of values to these variables will be a single state in the model. So the state dynamics changes the values of these variables. Uh, in our model, we also include the match history in the state. Um, that's a bit more complex. I may have time to go into that below, but just to know where it's not just, it knows something about the past. OK, so that's the Markov game model and uh, the state space. And uh, now I'm going to discuss uh, dynam questions of dynamics, the evolution of a match, um, both state changes. And especially, I'll be interested in uh, how success probabilities change, for example, the chance of, ch chance of scoring. Um, so this can be formulated as an estimation problem for sports analytics. So given the current match state, what is the chance that a team will succeed in the future? Okay, now success is deliberately vague, so that uh, can be configured uh, depending on the application and what you're interested in. It could be just winning the match or more specifically scoring the next goal or even more specifically, what's the chance that we can go with the team, the opponent, into drawing a penalty? Um, and we've actually looked at all of these uh, notions of success. Um, so what we want to do is we want to map the current state to expected future success. Um, and that kind of function is called a value function in machine learning in RL. So probably many of you have seen value functions if you've uh, looked at RL. Uh, what I want to do is I want to now give you uh, some examples of value functions in uh, sports um, that have been, uh, well, actually, sorry, I need one more concept, and then I will do that. Uh, so the value, uh, the expected success depends on the behavior of the agents, which we can model as uh, an agent policy. So let me see if I can switch. Uh, so I have a demo that I think makes this concept of a policy quite uh, vivid. So in general, a policy takes as input a state and gives you a distribution over actions. Uh, Disney Research built uh, this interactive demo for basketball. So you're seeing a match state, which is to say you're seeing where all the players are. And you see that uh, Duncan here is the ball holder. 
And Duncan has a number of actions at his disposal, right? He can pass to Parker, he can pass to Green, he can uh, attempt a shot on the basket. And what the lines are doing is uh, they're illustrating the uh, strengths of the probabilities of the actions. So in this model, the most uh, likely action is passing to Parker. The second most likely is uh, taking a shot at the basket. Okay, passing to Leonard is also possible but unlikely. Okay, so the policy uh, matches this current match state to distribution over actions. And if we change the state, then the policy will give us new uh, a new probability distribution. Okay, so now the probability of passing to Leonard has gone up. Uh, Parker has gone up. If we move Duncan really close to the goal, this vastly increases the probability of him taking a shot. Okay. Okay. So uh, think of the policy as summarizing the tendency of teams or players uh, to act. Okay. So now, if we have two policies for um, one for each team, uh, then that will define the expected. Uh, future actions, and that means that we can get an expectation over, say, the number of points that a basketball team would score, or the winning probability. And that's uh, what I will, that's what I will call the value function, and you know that's V of S. So V of S is the expected uh, total future reward in state S. Uh, and so now I will give examples of value functions that people have built. Um, so if you remember uh, last year, we had the glorious NBA final between Golden State and the True North, the Raptors. And, um, and ESPN was providing win probabilities So through the game. So what they were doing is, right, for every game state, they were producing the probability that the Toronto was winning. And so you can plot that over time and look at the evolution of these probabilities. Here's another example, this one from my group uh, for the NHL, a game between the Penguins and the Blue Jackets. Uh, so in orange here, we have uh, the probability that the Penguins will score the next goal. And uh, here at the beginning, around 2,400 seconds, uh, the Penguins are on the attack, so they have a fairly high chance of scoring the next goal. But the Blue Jackets defend, which brings down the probability. Then the game goes sort of back and forth. The Penguins uh, get the puck, uh, this go on the offensive. Blue, Jean, uh, Blue Jackets defend, another attack. And now around uh, here, around 2,900 seconds, the uh, model starts getting excited the penguins are really doing well in their offense and the, their goal scoring chance goes up and up and up and then they score so uh this illustrates the value function again right the goal probability is changing with the match match state um and it also shows you that the model has some capability to actually anticipate right the, the goal coming up okay one more example this time from soccer Let's see if I can find it. This is from Luke Bourne. So this is Madrid against uh, Barcelona, the Clasico. Uh, what you see left top is the actual footage uh, from the game. Uh, on the right, you see a schematic representation where the players are um, just two-dimensional dots. And then this, um, uh, at the bottom, you, you see a graph that is tracking uh, the expected possession value, uh, which they define to be the probability of scoring a goal in the current possession. So if we run this, uh, then you can sort of see as the game is evolving, um, right? the chances of scoring go up, go down, uh, and then with major events, uh, they're reflected in a change in the win probabilities, sorry, the scoring probabilities of getting the next goal. Uh, there we see uh, the models getting excited because Barcelona is getting close. Oh, but then they're deflected and uh, goes up. OK, so I uh, belabored this a, a bit because this concept of a value function is really key. So I, I hope this has given you a sense of uh, what the value function looks like, looks like and how it, how it changes over time. Um, 
Uh, we can also look at how the value uh, right, expected future success changes uh, over with space. Um, so this is from my group where we made a heat map on the hockey rink and um, the current action is shot. And we're asking, OK, given that uh, the attacking team moving from left to right has just taken a shot, what's the chance that they sure then uh, score the next goal? And uh, basically, you can see that uh, the model captures that the best thing is to be straight in front of the goal. Uh, so distance and angle matter as well. And then there's a sort of smooth drop off in the goal scoring uh, probabilities. OK, so once you have a value function, right, you can do all these plots. Um, uh, what, uh, but how do we get a value function? Right. And uh, this being learning, we want to learn them from data. Um, and fortunately, learning a value function is the key problem in uh, reinforcement learning, or maybe one of the key problems, but it's definitely up there. Um, and in this tree diagram, I just wanted to give a quick overview of kind of different approaches that I've been taking for different models and different sports. Um, so one, one question that comes up right away is that many of uh, standard um, markup decision process um, value function learning methods are built for discrete state spaces. Uh, but we actually have continuous space and time. If you remember, right, the puck is moving uh, on the continuous rink. So um, one thing you can do is discretize the rink uh, and space and time. So for example, uh, for the rink, you can uh, impose a grid on it. And there are even standard ways to do it uh, for most sports. Um, or you can decide you want to work with continuous data as they are. If you discretize, then uh, you have a discrete state space. Uh, you can estimate the transition probabilities basically by counting how, how often uh, play moves from one state to the other. And then once you've estimated the transition probabilities, you can apply dynamic programming, which is a really beautiful, um, very efficient algorithm for getting a value function from tr tr transition probabilities. Um, so my group has built that sort of model for hockey. That was our first hockey model. Um, Swedish collaborators have, ex uh, not collab colleagues have extended it. Uh, Chen and Puderman um, somewhat recently uh, built a discrete MDP model for the National Football League. So this can definitely be done. But nonetheless, you lose information when you discretize. Um, and uh, so there's been a I would say the recent trend is to uh, go with a, work with the continuous data directly. And again, there's a choice. You can say, OK, I've got continuous data. Am I still going to estimate transition probabilities uh, using some parametric model, like, say, a Gaussian or a um, Poisson distribution? And that has been done, for example, by the Harvard Sports Analytics Group. They have a very sophisticated stochastic process model for basketball. And another option, actually, is to not uh, estimate transition probabilities at all. Okay? And instead, directly try to learn um, the value function, so the directly try to learn the success probabilities from the data. Um, and I think it's actually amazing that this is even possible. Um, but uh, that's called a model-free approach because it doesn't build a transition model. Uh, and that's uh, in deep reinforcement learning using neural networks. It's probably the most common approach for, in general, for RL. Um, but you can certainly apply, apply it in soccer and, uh, sorry, in sports. And um, so our most recent paper on, um, on the NHL uh, was just like that, deep RL model with uh, model free. Um, and uh, also the soccer, the value ticker I showed you for the game between Madrid and Barcelona is also built using uh, neural network techniques. And one of the key uh, methods there is temporal difference learning, um, which was invented by Rich Sutton from the University of Alberta, one of the uh, pioneers of reinforcement learning. So I'd like to drill down on this method um, because um, it's not particularly well known in sports analytics. Um, and uh, I want people to know how it works. So 
they can use it. Um, so here's just an overview uh, from the intuitions without doing too much math. Uh, so uh, it's a local improvement method. So you start with some initial value function, and then you uh, you aim to uh, look, uh, successively make it better and better. And what does better mean? So um, the idea is that uh, different value estimates uh, at different times should be consistent with each other. Okay. And uh, if you detect an inconsistency between your estimate at time t and your estimate at time t plus 1, then you should revise your value estimate. Okay. I'm going to make this more precise in a minute, but that's the high-level idea. So make your estimates at different times consistent. Um, if you just look at the examples that we showed with value functions, you, you could see how they were strongly correlated. And also, if you know about the Bellman equation in RL, uh, right, it basically says that your current value estimate can be computed from future value estimates. So it's plausible that you really do want your successful value estimates to be consistent with each other. Okay? Another way to think of it is uh, because we have a temporal model, we have correlations between successive observations, and this approach exploits them. So let me give an example of uh, kind of walk through how it works. So let's imagine that we have uh, a, a running match, as I've been showing, and then current value, current, well, we know whether a goal was scored or not, and uh, we have our current value function estimates at every time point, uh, so like our value ticker. And it tells us what's the chance of scoring the next goal. So now we look at the first match state and we say, well, we think the team had a 55% chance of scoring. And, um, but then looking ahead, right, uh, in hindsight, actually, uh, given what happened next, the chance was only 70%, at least according to our current model. So uh, TD says, well, really, your estimate should have been 70%. If, if you'd known what was coming, you would have said 70% rather than 55%. So that means you're going to treat the difference uh, or, or the squared difference as an error. Okay? Then you go to the next match state and you say the same thing. Well, my estimate was 70%. Uh, my next estimate was 58%. So again, if I'd known what was coming, I would have said 58%, not 70%. So I'm going to treat that as another error signal. The difference, the square difference. Okay, and then finally, I said 58%. The actual outcome was 1. So again, if I'd known what the actual outcome was, I would have said 100%. So I get another error signal. So now for every uh, time instance, for uh, I get an error signal. And now I can um, um, try to minimize the sum of these error signals. So, for example, if I had a, was training a neural network, I could uh, take the gradient of these error signals and uh, adjust the weights to do gradient descent um, to minimize this. OK, so in contrast, uh, here's how a regression approach would work. And um, so you would actually fit the pr predictions towards the actual final outcome, right? You would say, oh, I actually know how this ended. I know that my team ended up scoring, um, right, rather than losing the puck. So uh, what I say is, oh, at first I thought they had a 55% chance of scoring, but actually it was one. Um, so then that gives me an error. Uh, then I thought they had a 70% chance of scoring, but it was actually one, another error. And so for every uh, at every point, I can say, well, what was the chance that I assigned them compared to the ground truth value? And then once I set it up like this way, I can uh, view it as a classification or regression problem where I say, well, the match state is the input, and this is the actual uh, output, the outcome. And, uh, right, and I want to learn a model that um, that is good at predicting the uh, actual outcome. So this is popular in sports analytics because many people in sports analytics are very comfortable with uh, regression classification. Um, 
but uh, the problem is that your that the uh, say regression treats uh, all the inputs as IID as independent. So when you take that approach, at least implicitly, you're ignoring all the dependencies. Um, okay. So uh, so if if you're tempted to uh, if you want to learn a value function and you're tempted to use a regression, uh, it can work pretty well. But uh, really, you should seriously think about using something like temporal difference learning. And maybe we can discuss more about that later. OK, so in the last section, I wanted to just uh, kind of give an example of what you can do with a value function. Uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the main application we're targeting is evaluating player performance. Um, so once you have the value function, you can define the impact of an action. And it's going to be uh, the difference between your chance of success given the action versus what your chance of success was before the action. This is also known as the advantage of the action in uh, RL. And so what this allows you to do, it allows you to measure the impact of an action. Uh, and then um, what uh, you can do is you can say, well, I have my player, and I can quantify uh, the impact of each of their actions, and then I can sum that up, and that will be my player metric. So this general schema is commonly used in sports. So you assign values to actions. So you say things like, well, goals are more valuable than shots, and shots are more valuable than assists, and assists are more valuable than passes. Um, but it's uh, not easy to know what the right numbers are. So RL gives you a way to uh, solve that problem. Once you have a value function, you can um, quantify the uh, value of each action um, in a precise, principled way. OK, so once we've done that, so now uh, we can do all kinds of player rankings. And I love producing them. And I love looking at them and seeing if they make sense. Um, this is one for the 2015-16 season. Um, and you can see, for example, Taylor Hall is a big star. He's at the top. Eric Carlson, uh, also very high. In fact, next year, he moved even up in our player ranking next year. Uh, one thing I'm highlighting Mark Scheifele here, because you can see that his salary is fairly low. So you can use this method to identify undervalued players. Um, and there was some validation, because if you look at the next season, he got a big boost. So um, the, uh, the team, you know, the, his team kind of agreed with, with us that he's a very good player. Um, for validation, OK, there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, another thing we did is we looked at standard metrics, uh, like um, win above replacement, uh, expected goals, plus minus. And I, I can explain what those are. But the main point is, if you take standard metrics that you find in the literature, uh, our metric has a very high correlation with many of them, and certainly the highest among most comparison methods. So it seems to me it captures a lot of the information that people already know to be relevant uh, about player performance. But then it, um, it uh, adds information to that. Um, OK, so just to emphasize the message here, the value function is key. Uh, the Harvard uh, group, uh, I think, phrased this very nicely in a 2014 paper. And they said, we, we assert that most questions that coaches, players, and fans have about a sport, particularly those that involve the offense, can be phrased and answered in terms of the value function. Um, so one example of how to use the value function I just gave, you can use it to rank players. Um, you can also use it, uh, oh, sorry, I should have said applied, to optimize coaching decisions. Uh, it was a nice paper from um, Rupert Ann Arbor at um, Sloan 2018. I can talk more about that. OK, so let me conclude. Uh, so in general, we use the Markov uh, game model to model ice hockey dynamics in the NHL. And the key problem that we um, looked at is how to predict the team's future success given the current match state. Uh, that's uh, very similar uh, to the key problem that reinforcement learning looks at, which is learning a value function. Uh, TD, temporal difference methods, are, I think, very promising for sports because they work directly in continuous space and time. And they don't make 
um, if you use a neural network anyway, you're not committed to particular parametric assumptions like Gaussian or Poisson, um, which, um, yeah, anyway, we can discuss more whether that's good or bad, but uh, it's hard to think of reasonable parametric assumptions for something as complicated as uh, ice hockey. So I think it's a plus. Um, and so what I showed you is um, a scalable Markov game model that allows you to evaluate all actions and it captures both the context in which an action occurs as well as long-term impacts. So if you make a pass that puts a player in a promising position so that they can make a carry so that they can then score a goal, that actually is captured by the model. Um, and uh, also this can be used to optimize decisions in sports and Eva evaluate players. So uh, I think I went uh, five minutes over time, so I'll stop now, but thanks very much for your attention so far. Hey, yeah. thanks so much. Yeah, we have actually some questions here and uh, it's very interesting talk and that's uh, why I was really excited to have you um, yeah. on this stream as well, right? Because we don't get, uh, I guess we've, we've never had a talk really about uh, using uh, reinforcement learning in uh, sports analytics. So I think right. we're making history. We're making history. Yeah, exactly. And it's actually, <laughs> honestly, there's a lot of interest in this. And uh, you mentioned briefly, like some regression methods that were used. And actually, t previously, I took a 200 level course, like long time ago in undergrad. And basically, they did this and they opened with, you know, the movie uh, Moneyball or something like, you, uh -huh. you, you know, yeah. So uh, it's just like very, very interesting that uh, now that um, there is obviously more techniques here and I, I guess more that's available to be used. So one of the questions was um, in terms of like kind of capturing the transition um, probabilities and stuff like that, do they pose any sort of computational uh, kind of challenges or in terms of the uh, approaches that you use, right? And you mentioned there are some techniques that use uh, computer vision, which uh, could also, in combination, could pose some challenges. So, like, what are things that you've seen, or things that you've worked on, and were there any ways you kind of like were able to optimize that? Uh, yeah, let me see. So, um, so the vision is maybe separate questions, but in the just looking. Okay, so if we have a um, in principle, if we have a discrete state. Uh, set of states like this, uh, right? We can uh, compute and we have a list of events. So we will see that, oh, from state zero to state one, right? A, a, a state zero was reached like 10,000 times. And out of those 10,000 times, 8,000 times it went to state one, uh, 1,000 times it went to state three. So uh, when you do all this counting, then, um, you can, uh, in principle, easily uh, estimate the frequencies. Um, there is a computational problem. Uh, it has to do with um, the curse of dimensionality. So let me maybe just go briefly back to our state space. State space, state space. Here we are. Right, so uh, if your state space is defined by uh, the number of variables in it, then every time you add a variable, even if it's discrete, you uh, multiply it exponentially. So for example, if you have what period am I in, that's three possible values, right? Then I have a grid with, let's say, maybe 50 different grid cells on the rink. So that's 50 different values. Uh, then I have the manpower, shorthanded, uh, advantage or not, another three and so forth. So in our first uh, model, I think we had something like 1.4 million states. So it can be handled. Uh, and actually, uh, if you look at my student, Kurt Routley's master's thesis, he describes some of the computational techniques that he uses to uh, deal with this large state space. Um, but it doesn't scale well. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that we've been moving to the um, continuous model free, uh, because then we uh, get away from the curse of dimensionality. Otherwise, we always have to make a tough choice. Oh, do I add this piece of information uh, to my model, but then I blow up my state space even more? Or do I just uh, ignore it and hope that it doesn't matter? So. Anyway, that was a bit of a long answer. Um, 
Do you also want me to speak to the computer vision, or is, uh, should I wait? Uh, for the sure, yeah, but I, I think the way you kind of separated out that question was, yeah, I think that that made more sense. So yeah, definitely yeah. curious to hear about the computer vision yeah. part as well. If you look on my website, I actually, I posted our uh, set of state space. So I posted, I mean, maybe, I, I don't know, I can show you my website, but I posted the data that we, so our first data set was not from Sportlogique, it's publicly available from NHL. And so we crawled all the event data. I think it's like, um, it's about 10 seasons. And so it's an Excel spreadsheet in SQL format. Um, so you can you don't have to uh, do the web crawling yourself. It's a bit old, but you know for research it's fine. And um, and we also posted our model. So we 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 basically have a table where every row is a state. Uh, sorry, every row is a state transition, and you can see all the millions of states and transitions that we find in the data. So if you want to check us out. Yeah, I could definitely link that in the notes afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll actually do that. Um, actually, on that note, yeah, another question was about the uh, kind of state space and how, well, it's a common challenge, right, in terms of reinforcement learning. And I, I guess you kind of answered that question, too, by going, uh, if you could pull up the slide with, like, that list of the uh, kind of ways that you use to represent the states. I think it was a oh. bit earlier with the table. And then you mentioned how every time you add something, it's like uh, kind of pick and choose. Yes, exactly yep. this one. Yeah. So I think uh, this kind of answered that question. Okay, I guess just to follow up on that, like um, you, right? Like your your team or your group ended up with this uh, kind of, uh, like what was there kind of, I guess, representations that you had to remove or you know that you figured that I guess it doesn't really add too much and then you dropped. During this process, yeah, uh, this is our latest model. So it's based on the um, it's based on the neural nets. So we're, right where we don't have to drop things. But um, some of our previous model, uh, well, our very first one, for example, we discretize time by period. Right. So we just so the model doesn't know. It just knows what period it's in. It doesn't know that there's like a minute left, for example, or five. Uh, so that was that really bugged me. <laughs> that sacrifice. Uh, our second model, which is an MIT Sloan paper, um, we worked hard on discretizing the grid. We sort of simultaneously uh, discretized the the grid, the rink, and learned the transition model. So we learned we learned a discretization of the rink uh, that supports. Um, a valid transition model, um, and that's also been done in soccer. So that's there's almost like a whole subfield of sports analytics about how to discretize uh, space and time. Um, but yeah, so the period is an example. Uh, another thing that really uh, would not scale is I'd like to capture uh, facts about specific teams and ideally specific players. Right, so if you look at the model I'm showing here, it knows um, it knows whether the action is taken by the home team or by the away team, but it doesn't know whether, uh, say, the shot was made by the Canucks or by the Blackhawks. But if you do that, then um, you have something like thirty teams. So right, that now you're blowing up your state space times thirty, and um, your transitions become tr observed transitions became sparse. So yeah, so personal or customizing the model uh, to capture differences between teams and players is um, really difficult in this discrete setup. Um, again, not impossible and you know the longer discussion, but um, it's it's much easier. I think that's a fair statement in the uh, kind of neural net continuous setup. I see. I see. Thanks mm -hmm. for the uh, answer to that question. Um, so you also mentioned that I, I guess in some cases you might have the uh, uh, knowledge of historical matches or the outcome of historical matches. I think you mentioned. Oh no, I meant match the match history. history. Yeah. So okay, what I meant, okay. what I meant is when you're seeing watching the match, um, you know, like let's say if three passes happen in a row and each of them is getting closer to um, to the goal. 
uh, then the team has a sort of momentum, right? And that that matters to whether or not they're going to score. Um, so we have uh, we basically use a recurrent neural network to encode the match history. Um, okay, so that that makes sense then. Uh, yeah. I, I guess on on that note, uh, yeah. one question was. Can player injuries be incorporated in the model? And I, I guess we can generalize this to kind of like meta, you know, like kind of situations, right? Because what you mentioned is within the match. And hmm. there are some things that you mentioned that are on this table that are mostly within the match. But then there's, I guess, like one or two things. I guess like home away team is kind of like out, like kind of like a meta thing. And then are there other kind of uh, things like player injuries, injuries that you would include or could include? Yeah. Um, okay, so in the model, like, so if you look at our published papers, it's really only our latest paper, which was in NeurIPS uh, last year on learning player representations. Um, so that could include information. So when it predicts whether or not a team is going to succeed, uh, you could include there who's injured or not by kind of excluding the player. Um, so that's really, but we haven't done it. So I think it's a great question. And um, a related one is the effect of substitutions, uh, right? So I'd, I'd love to be able to advise a coach on, oh, you should be fielding this player or maybe start with this line. Um, in our, uh, I also mentioned that I work for Sport Logique. Uh, so we're actually, we there we, we're building models to predict match outcomes and there we do have, for every player, we have a specific model, how important they are, and uh, that gets factored into the match outcome. And um, and if you tell me who's injured, then we scratch the player and change our predictions. Um, uh, but uh, it's not RL-based. Uh, so it's quite, it's, yeah. We're doing yeah. that with, with Sport Logique, but not in these RL models. But yeah, it's a great question. I see. I mean, it is true that uh, oftentimes in industry that uh, ML models or ML techniques are kind of uh, augmented with some sort of rules-based approach or just like some simple like approach that work together. It's possible in yep. uh, quite often in industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So another question is because you mentioned that uh, I guess the the problem you're you're working with, right? Like it's possible that you can um, make it in a discrete space, but then it's kind of more like a continuous space and uh, you mentioned like model free approaches and I, I guess like a question was that uh would policy gradient work here since it's like continuous and i guess we're model free approach yeah that's another great question um well uh you have to be uh so this is i think i mentioned um i know i didn't make this maybe as clear as it should be but we're this is uh what's the terminology so different people so there's like uh, policy evaluation and um, policy learning. So we're not really learning a policy. We basically take the policy, we estimate the policies from data and then take them as fixed. And then we learn the value function. So sometimes uh, it's like on policy learning or uh, prediction. I think Sutton calls this prediction versus control. Uh, Russell Nor Norway call this um, uh, passive uh, RL versus active RL. So, yeah. But I think it could be worth uh, trying out. Uh, but, yeah, that's it's worth because in our application, we don't control the players, right? We're not the coaches. So, we cannot really say, oh, you guys should be attacking on the right or on the left. Uh, we can maybe recommend this, um, but we. We cannot actually say, oh, let's change our policy and then see if uh, return is better. So, Yeah, yeah, true, true. Definitely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, we have another question, which is, uh, actually, let me quickly, quickly scroll down for one sec. Okay, yeah, so um, one question is because, yeah, like sports is a kind of RL problem that still has somewhat of a i guess like smaller space though, though it's pretty big too right but compared to yeah. let's say chess right which is like definitely discrete like as yeah. discrete as it can be mm -hmm. um, like what are some differences that you've 
noticed, right? Because sports does have some rules, right? Like it has some some expectations compared to, let's say, a totally wild environment. And I guess yeah. like if you can compare like just like very discrete games such as chess and then sports, like what are some differences that you see? Yeah. Um, so first, let me say something about the commonalities, which I think was also in the, the comments. So it's it's very true that one of the reasons why sports is well suited to our is because we have um, we have an action space, right? The rules say here are the type of actions you can you can make, uh, and we have a reward function that's defined. So so it's not like say a self driving car, right? Where you're like, eh, what's the reward function and so we know those things, um, but yeah, it's uh, compared to chess. Uh, well, we have uh, so there's the continuous nature, and we have non-determinism, right, all over the place. So when a player takes makes a pass, they really don't know what's going to happen with the puck. Uh, you know, is it going to get to their own guy, <laughs> get to <laughs> intercept it? Whereas in chess, of course, if you make a move, then you get, uh, you know, that the piece is going to go there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, maybe, so non-determinism, continuity. Uh, there's another um, sort of more subtle difference uh, to these kind of more random games. Like, let's say, even if you compare chess with poker, so in chess, there really is a unique best way to play. And if you have an optimal strategy, then you will always win. Or checkers, for example, Jonathan Schaefer from the U of A, he has a, a checkers program that plays optimally in every position. But in these random games, there really isn't such a thing. Um, like, OK, let's do a simple sports example, uh, penalty kick in soccer. Right, so it's not the case that I can say as a penalty shooter, oh, I always shoot into the right corner. That's the best thing to do, because if I always do it, then the the other goalie can just dive uh, into the into the right corner and stop my ball. So I have to be uh, unpredictable and I have to adapt what I'm doing to my opponent. So I cannot just say, oh, I know the optimal strategy and I, and I execute it and I'll win. So that's maybe a more subtle difference. Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, Great those question. are really good Great points. Question. Yeah, it's a good question. So that's uh, my uh, colleague, Tim Schwartz. I can't quite remember the name of the paper, but I'm sure you can find his website. He actually, he's done a taxonomy of different sports, um, sort of their general characteristics and what makes them easy or hard. Um, like, for example, um, cricket. He points cricket and baseball. He points out they have more of a discrete turn taking, right? Like in baseball, you're up for uh, for a pitch, and then you pitch, and no one's interfering with you. And so, sports where that that really are doing discrete turns are easier than continuous flow sports. And anyway, so if you're interested in this question of kind of what are general properties that have an impact on on learning, he's got a paper on that. Yeah, that's that's a really good example, I guess, versus uh, like like there are some sports um, that are slightly more discreet or have traits of discreteness that others don't have. I, it's, it's very fascinating for, I guess, myself and also the viewers, right? Like sometimes we uh, every time we hear about different types of RL research problems and the different kind of unique problems that they face, like it's it's always like a good question that uh, we like to hear about. Uh, I think we have like time for like one or two more questions. I think one of them was so you mentioned that uh, it, it there are possible uses, right? Like recommending tactics or gap analysis. I think on one of the slides, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you mentioned, and I, I think something about like potentially salary on on one of the slides. And then the question was, uh, you know, like would this if implemented, like was could there be any any way that uh like players might exploit that like depending on you know like <laughs> like reverse exploiting that that kind of uh if you're using like the agent to kind of ev evaluate or predict their performance or give it some sort of value i, I think is what they meant well it's a bit of a negative way to put it uh i mean i like to say a player can say well i'm 
here's an objective metric that's showing that uh, I'm worth more. And so, um, uh, and especially if you're worried about bias towards certain players, um, then this could be a way to overcome it. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd love for them to do this. Uh, we actually, we, I've studied this sort of player salary quite a bit. I uh, you know, didn't go into detail today, but um, we did a, uh, one of our papers, we showed that it actually is good at predicting salary two years in advance. So if you ask, okay, from this current season, who's going to make more, you know, who's going to go up significantly in salary in not next season, but the one after. And so, uh, you know, at least what I'd like to conclude from that is that it's uh, our player ranking is actually a good early warning signal. Sometimes we're ahead of the teams. Um, because I think some players come in, they're maybe not so well known, and the coaches are like, oh, are you guys doing really well or not? Um, so I think this can actually help you as a junior player. Um, there was another case uh, I mentioned this in my paper, Jason Spezza, he was ranked really highly. Um, and one season was playing with the Senators when they were a terrible team. So um, uh, the team was very bad, but he came out really high in our ranking. So that shows that actually we can separate the quality of the team from the quality of the player. And then what was interesting, I looked at the story, and then for the next season, he asked to be uh, traded early. So, like, when a player is really unhappy with their current team, they can they can do that, and he uh, and he and the league agreed with him. So, so there's another scenario where okay, he managed it anyway. But if you remember, if you imagine the player is stuck on a bad team, uh, they could point to our ranking, right, and say, okay, this I'm really I really should be in a better team, and. Um, so I think it can support them, help the stars shine, you know. So Yeah, I think it's definitely more uh, kind of explainable in the sense that, right, like when we're doing, let's say, the value functions in this kind of, uh, I guess, like the sports situation where you're more establishing it on things like scoring or things that are just like more obviously good right? Like winning, mm -hmm. scoring, um, then I, I suppose that it's just more justifiable than let's say there is some metric for a more ambiguous situation. Like you, you mentioned the example of self-driving car. So I, I think the kind of rules or like the, the world, the, the space within sports is, yeah, it kind of does, you know, it doesn't seem so negative when you uh, kind of mention it like that. I think the, I think the, the question wasn't, meant to be like oh they're they're yeah, gonna try to like yeah <laughs> but but yeah. actually i i i think it's the same with all types of evaluations it's possible for that to happen um but yeah in sports because of the kind of space and the rules it's uh probably still good overall for the team to kind of do this i think okay we'll have just like one last question actually so you had a slide which i uh -huh. think it had uh this venn diagram you had sports analytics within reinforcement learning like have you heard any sort of uh you know like people who you know might not agree with this or you know if they if they all kind of mention some sort of counter example and like what can can you elaborate on this or like if people point out like oh it's not really you know do you hear that from people um well i i guess there's me and my group of believers uh no, I wouldn't say. I, I honestly think the main issue is that um, not everyone in machine learning knows reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's temporal data, right? It's about dynamics. Um, like it doesn't come up in machine learning 101. And so, and especially like people who work for teams, um, again, of course, many very, very sophisticated, but probably 80% or so, um, the strength is more in like knowing the sport and connecting with the players and the coaches. So yeah, I think the, I don't think it's that anyone has like a kind of deep reason why RL doesn't work. It's just, they're not so familiar with it. So that's, this was part of my motivation for giving the talk today and also going into some of the methods where I hope to say, look, it's really appropriate. It's not that hard to apply. <laughs> it's not that, you know, it maybe sounds all very like okay, advanced machine learning, but um, applying it is not not that difficult. I don't think so. Yeah, but I'm I you know I'm open to critique, and if anyone has like a, has a reason why um, 
RL isn't appropriate, um, you know, I'd be really interested to hear it. So. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I think, um, like I mentioned, and we talked a bit about too, right? Like RL is pretty suitable for stuff like very discrete and kind of closed environment stuff, like I guess chess being an example. And this kind of sits in the middle ground. And then there's also RL applications in like, let's say different types of industry where it's like totally wild uh, action spaces, totally wild, like uh, ambiguous rewards. So I think mm -hmm. this sits like fairly uh you know, squarely in the middle. If you, I don't know if you kind of agree with that assessment. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I think so. You made good points, Susan, earlier, right? You mentioned <laughs> how the action space is defined, how the rewards are defined. So, so that helps. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this has been great, and I yeah. hope a lot of people get more interested in uh, using RL for uh, sports analytics. And thanks again for for being on yeah. here. All right. Thank you, Susan, for organizing, and thanks. Thank you to the audience for listening. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, I guess I forgot to say that you can...